Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody, to another very exciting episode of our show. Today, we are talking to Rebecca Goldfarb. Rebecca, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. And Rebecca is an estate planning attorney and practices elder law as well. The name of the firm is Goldfarb and Lou. And I've had the pleasure of talking to her prior to the show, and I'm already amazed by her personality. So this is going to make for a very exciting conversation. Uh, let's de- let's delve right into it. Uh, we're going to be talking about something very important today, which on our show, we've talked about what is this and what is that, but we we haven't talked about the operating procedures very much. And, and Rebecca is going to help us today and guide us essentially through what the steps are that a person has to do. Um, when they are setting up a trust and how to deal, what happens when the trust is set up. So one of the first questions I have for you, Rebecca, is um, how should individuals begin to process the process of organizing their assets um, when considering setting up a trust? Well, we get people, uh, you know, clients who come to us from very Mm -hmm. young people to very old people. So some people have very few assets and that's a relatively easy process. And other people have And they're not usually very well organized. So I think one of the biggest parts of thinking about your estate plan is to get your ducks in a row is getting your assets organized. So what we do, and and I don't know about other firms, but what we do is we create a simple um, Excel spreadsheet and it has different uh, areas to fill in. So the first is real estate. The second is any businesses you might own um, or have interests in, you know, you can be, you know, a partial owner in something, um, any retirement accounts, bank accounts, other other assets that might have value, they could be vehicles or, or, or collections, mm-hmm. uh, life insurance, all those kinds of things. And it's really just putting everything down uh, on that spreadsheet for us. And then before our clients have a meeting with us, with me, they have a client, they have a meeting with uh, our paralegal, Michelle, mm-hmm. and she walks through every single asset. She tries to get account numbers. What so many attorneys do, maybe in lieu of this, I'm not sure, is they create a schedule at the end of a trust. So you've probably seen this before where it's schedule A, schedule B, schedule C. Right. And so people have their their assets written there, right? It could be community property, separate property. It depends on the situation. Right. What this leads people to believe is that, oh, here's my trust and here's the schedule. This must mean these assets are in my trust. It has nothing to do with that, right? Uh. So it's a false sense of security. When I say, okay, so what's in your trust? And they rattle it off. And then we go to look really who the owner is. And none of it is in the trust or very little is in the trust. So I think that the problem, even with people who are who have trusts already, who are coming mm-hmm. to us for a review, is they have this misconception that it's properly funded. And I think emotionally, you know, lawyers aren't usually really in touch with the emotional part of their practice, but I'm extremely in touch because estate planning and elder law is like 80% emotion. Right. And then 20 percent law. So when you when you've gone through this whole process and you've and you've signed your documents, you feel like, okay, I'm done. Right. And we always tell people, okay, you're almost done. The light is at the end of the tunnel. Now we have to fund the trust. So what I'm going to share are some ideas about how to get that ready for a lawyer, if you're brand new to this process. But even if you already have a trust, it's really important that you review it because I guarantee your trust was not 100% funded at the time. And if it's been a while, things have changed, right? Assets have changed. Or you know this in your line of work, people refinance 
And right. then the mortgage company doesn't put it back in the trust, but the client doesn't know that, right? And so so then they're at risk for for probate. Correct. So and I think then we deal with tax debt petitions and, and things like that, which, yeah, <clears throat> are not fun. You better be, or it's better to be organized. <laughs> and I think that unless there's family drama, this is the hardest part is like, getting all this organized, right? And and then I want people to to have the mindset of, hey, when we when when we need to use these documents, it means somebody has lost capacity or somebody has died. In mm-hmm. both of those cases, someone else is stepping in your shoes. Right. right. So if it's a trust asset and you're incapacitated, who's managing that asset? Right whoever the trustee is, if you're incapacitated, this could be a problem. That means that that the successor trustee is managing this asset, right? Now, if the asset is in your name and not in the trust name, it means the power of attorney is doing that. And so it's right. really important that you realize as the client, when that time comes and you have a gazillion bank accounts because you have your travel account and you have your... Right account and you have it for this rental property and you have, right? All, a lot of those get consolidated. So a part of this process that I think attorneys fail their clients on is not only are we getting the assets organized that will go into the trust or be um, the trust will be named as a beneficiary of, but also what are all your bills? Right. And, and who pays them? And are they auto paid? Right. Because when we consolidate those accounts, those those don't work anymore and we don't we don't know it as the power of attorney or the successor trustee so there's a lot that goes into this asset bill kind of thing organization that makes total sense okay let's take a little step back because i i definitely want to touch you gave us so many valuable information i definitely want to touch on a few things okay. one of the things that i want to talk about is let's talk about the type of assets which somebody should expect to place in a trust. Now we all know your home. That's the easiest thing. Your primary residence. You you take title as John Doe, uh, trustee uh, of the blah 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 uh, trust, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have that one, and that's kind of like the easiest one. But what about the other assets? You mentioned things, bank accounts. People don't think about those things. People may, may not even know how in the hell do I put a bank account in a trust, or what about my life insurance? Like, and what about my collection of paintings and what about my you know my grandfather's gold watch you know and things like that so so tell me when we're doing the inventory and i know that you i'm sure you guide the clients uh you know with your spreadsheet but for 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 our audience what are the assets i need to consider when i'm thinking about funding the trust so it so you mentioned the home which is perfect and Mm -hmm. it's really important that people realize that just because your home is mentioned that it goes to your kids doesn't mean it's in the trust, right? So right. it's the deed that's changing, that's right. saying the trust owns it with you as the trustee managing it. Yeah. And we we talk about a business, right? So it could be mm-hmm. a law firm, it could be a dentist, it could be a beauty shop, it could be any kind of business, janitorial business, any kind of business. Right. So look at the entity of it. If it's a sole proprietorship, then we look at just the trust funding part, right? Are those mm-hmm. bank accounts titled in the name of the trust? Because the sole proprietor is just really you, right? It's not right. an entity. But yes. if we have an, a corporation or an LLC or a partnership, then we need to look at the operating paperwork for those different entities. In an LLC, for example, it's an operating agreement, right? In a corporation, it's the bylaws. We need to look at that and we need to say, hey, Are there any rules that we need to follow to assign that entity to the trust? Mm -hmm. And then we have to follow what those rules are. Um, If it's just you personally, there's probably not many rules. But if you have partners, there are going to be rules, right? Right, absolutely. So we need to do that. We did a trust administration um, that that lasted for way too long because the client, the person who died was not our client. Uh, The trustee was our client. And when they did this, uh, when 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 she did the trust and did the funding and she was a CPA, so the trustee thought, oh, she's got to have everything organized. Her business assets were not assigned to the trust. Mm-hmm. So I actually went to her house because I wanted to avoid probate, right? I went to her house and I wow. looked through boxes of it, just looking for this one page assignment. <laughs> I couldn't find it. So 
If you have over 184 and a half thousand outside of a trust, meaning the trust doesn't own it, meaning it's not jointly owned with someone else, meaning the trust isn't a beneficiary or there isn't another person as a beneficiary, mm -hmm. then it's going to trigger up to go to court. One of the main reasons people do a trust is to avoid court. So right. this funding element often is overlooked by both lawyers and clients is critical to the success of your trust working the way you expect. That so, th so that's if you have life insurance, unless you are doing advanced planning with an irrevocable life insurance trust, but if you just have regular old, a regular old revocable trust and regular old term or even a mm -hmm. permanent policy, the beneficiary of that life insurance trust, I'm sorry, the beneficiary of that life insurance policy can be the trust. And right. if you have minor kids, right, or just kids under 30, because right. remember, one's frontal lobe of their brain is not fully developed till between <laughs> 25 and 30, right? So, yes. and it's also a way of asset protection. It's you get in a car accident, right? And the PI attorney is going after your assets, but if it's held in trust for you, then they can't go after it if you're not the trustee. If you're in a bad relationship, that spouse or that girlfriend or boyfriend isn't going to go after anything, right? Because you don't have control over it. Somebody else is the gatekeeper. So we put the beneficiary of those life insurance uh, policies as it could be the spouse first and the trust second, or just the trust right off the bat. So and then you think about other, you know, a new thing, retirement plans, same thing. You have to be the owner of a retirement plan, but you want the trust to be at, at, at least the second beneficiary as backup. The spouse can be the first. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What about personal property? Valuable personal property. So you, you just have to interrupt me when, okay. Personal property. So we do, I think all lawyers do this, a, a personal property assignment, right? So in your trust, it's like whatever, 50 pages, right? And then there's this assignment of personal property. It's just a one page thing. You, so you're assigning all of that, but what's mm -hmm. really important. And this is a teeny bit off topic, but so important is that you want to make sure if there are special things that they are specifically gifted to particular people. Do mm -hmm. not ever say, oh, it goes to my kids all equally. They'll figure it out. Because right. I can't tell you, I met a pro judge about 15 years ago at a breakfast. And I said, hey, can you tell me? I'm just curious. You know, I was relatively new at this. Can you just tell me um, what is the smallest amount that you have seen litigated. And I mean litigated, not that it just triggered pro litigated, right? $10,000. Right. Now, you wow. know, these attorneys charge, right? And I said, is it mostly men or women? And without even hesitating, he said women, right? <laughs> so it's like people will fight over grandma's green bowl. It right. is so important to ask kids, don't make the assumption, ask your kids, what do you want? And then name that as a specific gift. Yeah. You know what? It's funny. You, it reminded me of something. I'm going to share it with my audience. I, I was uh, I was watching an episode of a TV show and, and and the guy was like, you know, I have to realize my mortality, whatever. So he, he gathers his family together and he says, you know, here's are your stickers, your blue, your yellow, you know, put stickers on whatever you want. <laughs> and it was very funny because, you know, in the end of the episode, he's putting on his robe and there's a sticker on it. It's like, you know, they really took me seriously. <laughs> You have so to I, use tape though, because we've had client situations where they put stickies on it and then the sticky falls off. So right. you gotta put tape oh, with yeah. the sticky. Yes, yes. Okay. This is very good. There, everything you share with us is extremely informative. Um, let's talk about uh, the mechanism through which individual can access and manage assets held within a trust during their lifetime. So what, what level of control do they retain? Because I think there is a hesitation. Here's one of the things that people are hesitant about. I'm putting it into trust, and then my kids are going to evict me from my own house when I'm old. Blah. There is a lot of that. There is a lot of that misinformation. So that is not the case. So let's talk about the control and what control is retained and how it works. So as the grantor, the person who creates the trust, and the trustee, the person who manages, and the beneficiary, 
that we have all three of these roles when mm -hmm. we create a trust, right? So I own all of the assets in the trust as the, as the grantor of creating this, right? And right. then I manage all of the assets. So while I have capacity, and this is the big question, while I have mental capacity, I am 100% in charge of these assets, of, of putting them in, taking them out, selling them 100% the same as if I didn't have a trust. Mm -hmm. I am also the lifetime beneficiary of this trust. Now, there are advanced tax planning trusts where this is not the case. So I am only speaking about revocable living, living trust. trust. Right. So I am the lifetime beneficiary. So it has to benefit me. All the assets in there have to benefit me. Now, let's just fast forward. I become incapacitated right? Mm -hmm. Dementia, whatever, accident, whatever. Then I can't be the manager anymore. Right. Then I am trusting my successor trustee to manage those assets for my benefit. Because even if I'm incapacitated, I am the lifetime beneficiary of that. Right. Trust. So when you say that, theoretically, you know, there's the theoretical, this is how it should work. This is what the law says. And then there's the reality of how it works. We focus Obviously, we know the former, but we focus on the latter. What is the reality? Because theoretically, right. it doesn't always work that way, right? Mm -hmm. So with the example that you gave, kids are now the trustees, right? Or we very rarely ever say your co-trustees. We pick one and then the other because right. these financial institutions more and more are not accepting co-trustees, co-agents, and powers of attorney. So we say, okay, who's next in line now? That person is the person you are trusting, just like with the power of attorney, to stand in your shoes and act solely for your benefit and not his or her own. If you have a shred of doubt, mm -hmm. I don't care what your relationship is with that person. Don't make him or her the successor trustee because they do. See, I was going to swear. They do. <laughs> right? To, to old people all the time, it happens. Right. So you have to be really certain. And if you're not, we need to set up other mechanisms so that there's safeguards in there to protect you. We are huge advocates of our elder population. Um, this is, you know, a big love of ours. So we see this all the time. And, and, you know, another thing that I, I'm going to take the opportunity to mention it, you also practice elder law. And I think that we should have you back on the show to discuss just elder law. So for the time being now, um, let's talk about taking assets in and out of a trust. So you, you do put the asset in a trust. And now you, we have explained to our audience, you don't lose control. Don't worry about it, you know, blah, 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 and et cetera. That's very important things. But now let's say I change my mind. You know, I have a bunch of assets in my trust and it's like, you know what? No, I don't want this in there. What are the mechanism and how, first of all, is it possible to take stuff out of a trust stuff that you put in a trust? I guess that's the simple question. It is. As long as it's a revocable trust, you could do whatever you want. Take them in, take them out. Great. So how does the, how does the process work when somebody says, Rebecca, mm -hmm. I take mean, my house out of the trust? Most people don't do that. I don't know that we've ever removed a, a, a trust asset for a client. Right. We, as the lawyers, deal with real estate and businesses and clients right. deal with all the other financial assets, but they might um, take an asset out of a trust if, if they're selling a business, right? Or, right. or something like that. But really it's just paperwork, right? It, depending upon what the asset is, it's just filling out new paperwork. And so, so if it's real estate or a business, you might need a lawyer to help. But if it's any other financial asset, the financial institution itself or your financial advisor um, or CPA or the lawyer, you know, every, all kinds of people can help with those forms. It, Got it. It's Perfect. That makes total sense. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, the, the, the trust, you know, once, once you organize the trust, um, you make a decision which is in a point in your life. Now we know that life changes. People may get divorced, new children, um, grandkids. I mean, things change. So how do you help your clients update their plans so that it reflects the current situation? You know, Because I mean, if somebody does a trust when they're 30, at 80, most likely things will be different. So, 
so that I don't wait until I'm 80 to make the changes or when it's too late. How do you assist your clients in keeping things current? This is a really good question. And I hesitate to answer because we do it differently from everyone else. So oh, you're saying this is the secret sauce. I don't want to share. I wish everyone would do it the way that we do it. Right. Um, but it is a secret sauce because people don't that lawyers don't see the value in it. Right. And I think they don't see the value in the way we do it because you make less money, quite right. honestly. And we're not in it to make money. We're in it to serve our clients in the best possible wow. way. So what we do, and then I'll tell you what I think the norm is, just from what I hear from other lawyers and, mm -hmm. and clients who come to us, is we set up our plans in an extremely detailed, more detailed, clients who have come to us from other attorneys are like, no one's ever talked about it. And I'm like, I know, I know it happens all the time. <laughs> So in an extremely detailed way, we we dive into layers and we have backup plans because stuff happens, right? And so right. we but let's say it wasn't that that something failed per se. Plan A didn't fail. So so it's great that plan B is there, but I've just changed my mind, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is as a part of our flat fee, it's a life plan. So oh, wow. anytime a client has a question, a concern, they need a resource, right? They want to talk about whatever, they just call us and it's just part of our life plan. So we know when it warrants an update or not, right? And then every few years, we used to do it every year and nobody would take us up on it. So now the sweet spot seems to be every five years. We offer a maintenance meeting and we say, here, now's the time you review it. Let's come to the meeting. Let's talk about it. Let's see if it warrants any updates, right? And we'll go through each document and make sure everything is funded properly and nothing has changed along the way. So we're really hands-on, but that's not the norm. Um, and then we do charge if we're doing updates because some of them are super simple. Um, mm -hmm. Probably don't, you know, when it's more time consuming to generate a bill than to just do the work, we just do the work, right? But if it's um, but if it's gonna take some time, then then we bill our clients at that time. But our we're super fast, so it's not that much. The majority of lawyers, I believe, um rely on the client to know when to come back. And that's mm -hmm. why so many plans fail, right? My definition, and this is just what I want, I wish every lawyer had the same definition. I want these plans to honor our clients' wishes. They have to avoid court and they have to maintain family harmony. And yet 99% of every plan that comes to us will fail in one of those ways. So it, it's incumbent upon us as lawyers to be the educators, to be the, the counselors, the guides, right? To direct our clients. If a client came to us and said, I want my three kids to be co-trustees, I would say absolutely hands down, no. And if and we will educate them enough so that they realize it. But in the extreme case, if they said, well, that has to be, I would say, I can't help you. Because I know the plan is going to pull family members apart. So I know that's sort of off topic, but no, it's, it's not. You know what I was actually thinking, how inspiring. I really, I really appreciate it. First of all, death is a subject matter that, you know, it's always tiptoed around when it comes to family, et cetera, et cetera. So what your firm does of being there, you know what, you, with your fee, we are here for you for the for the lifetime, you know, that's a peace of mind. And that's worth it for sure. Um, a lot to somebody. And the fact that, you know, you, you update and you help, you assist and you guide, I think this is what it's all about. I do the same thing in my business. You know, it's, it's uh, to put it, it's important. Sometimes the client do not know what they want. We do what we do all the time. So if somebody has an idea, um, we have to tell them, look, in our experience, when you do this, this, and this, this is what happens. Right. I've done it many, many times before. And I can tell you that 90% of litigation is when people have co-trustees or whatever the situation may be. And that that really is what distinguishes, you know, an advisors between somebody who's just providing a service. So I, I think that what you said, it's 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 very important. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that with our audience. That's 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 great. Um, let's talk about your journey. This is something that always fascinates me and and uh, and I think it's important. Um when you were a little girl, did you want to be an attorney? 
So when I was 12, I decided I was going to be an attorney. Wow. My grandparents on my mom's side showed me their trust. Okay. And said, I'm the only grandchild, right? So, so they, I had special relationships with both my grandparents, um, which is probably why I do elder law because <laughs> right. I love them. Anyway, they brought me their trust and they were like, here's what it says after we're gone. And I said, you know, doing it that way is a huge mistake because they had a son they didn't deal with. They didn't have a relationship with, and they were making him a partial owner of the house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, grandma, grandpa, you can't do it. You got to go back to your lawyer. So over like a few years, I think when I was like 15, they finally did it. They changed it to give him some money, but don't force people to work together who can't work now. Right. So I felt like that was important. So then fast forward, um, I was a paralegal in a law firm after college. And then I knew I wanted to go to law school, but I didn't know exactly. So I went to do um, environmental and animal law. I was like, this is my passion. This is who I am. And then I realized after I got my specialty certificate and all that, like, oh my God, this is all litigation. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm not a litigator, right? I want to hug my clients. I want them to tell me they love me. I want to love them, right? This is not for me. So I met Din, my dear friend and law partner in 2005. And in 2008, we decided to sit down. And by the way, on our website is our birth story. We actually did a video together of our birth. Oh, that's awesome. But uh, this is a short version. So we printed out a list of all the areas of law one could practice and went out to dinner and went through each one. What are we interested in? What will feed our souls? What could have a marketing plan? All of that. And estate planning was the only thing that would do three things. We could really make a difference in people's lives. We could have lifelong relationships and we didn't have to go to court. And there's no other area that you can do that. So we were like, I guess it's a state. I didn't even take wills and trusts in law school. I wasn't going to do this. Right. (laughs) So then we spent a year or two like learning how to do everything and and all of it. I guess that was in maybe 2007. So in 2008, we were like, okay, here we are. So um, and then we added on uh, elder law because if we live long enough, right, everyone's going to need elder law in some right. capacity. So so that is our our. That's story. wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with me. All right. Before before I let you go, I, I, I like to do my exercise at the end of the episode, which is um, basically, you know, I have a list of 30 questions. I would love for you to pick a random number and I will ask you that question. So you are responsible <laughs> for the questions I'm going to ask you. Oh. Go ahead. Wait, it's between one and what? One and 30. 30. Um, well, my favorite number is 117 for some random. Okay. So I'm going to say 17. 17. Oh, I like this one. Why were you given your name? <laughs> I want to tell you why I gave my daughter my name because I know that. Um, Good. So I'm I'm uh, half Jewish, mm-hmm. and so in the Jewish religion, you name someone after someone else who has died. Okay. And so there was a grandmother on that side who was named Rebecca. And I think my parents just both really liked it, but I will say they were major hippies um, and they never used their middle names. So they were like, she doesn't need a middle name. So I don't have a middle name. So it's just Rebecca Goldfarb is it. I'm going to, since because of this story, I'm going to share, I'm going to share a story. This is what I, why I love these questions. I also never had a middle name because in Italy, we don't use middle names. But when I married my wife, she gave up her last name, which is Baker. So I took that as my middle name. So my legal middle name now is Baker. So that's a funny story because people ask me, it's like, you're from Italy. What, what is that Baker doing in the middle? Now you know the story. Um, okay. Oh, you really love baking. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now let me ask you this question because, uh, you know, now you brought it up. So I need to know, we need to know, why did you, wh- why did you give your daughter your name? So... Her name is Taryn Willow Dugall. And we wanted to honor the Jewish side. So so we picked Uh something from each of our cultures. Um, We wanted to honor the Jewish side. And my grandma Thelma was the most recent person who died. So we knew it had to be a T name. And on 
my mom's side is Irish and Scottish, so it had to be a Celtic name. So that's where it came from. My husband is Oliver, and so he um, was named because his mom loved the olive tree. So we had to pick a tree to honor her because she's passed away. So we both love willow trees. So that was it. And then he's also um, uh, East Indian. And so she has his last name. So it it's all of us. But then the funniest part is, and the cutest part is during the pandemic, out of the blue, we have no idea why she was like, my name's Snowy. That's what wow. I want. So now everyone at school for three years knows her as Snowy. No one knows her as Taryn. Wow. <laughs> So, um, but now she's starting to tell new people her name is Willow. So, you know, you just got to go with names as they come to you, I think. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, it's been so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Um, Stay on. I'm going to do my sign off, but you stay on so we can say our our own goodbyes. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. One more thing, actually, Rebecca. I want to, this is, there's going to be your contact information in the show notes, uh, but what is the best way to get a hold of you? So people can call our 800 number, which is 800-489-1984. You can visit our website, which is goldfarblue.com. And then I think you can do contact us at goldfarblue.com as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, everybody who's joined us. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Probate Realtor Show. Find more episodes and interact with us at probaterealtor.la. That's probaterealtor.la. Listen, ask questions, and get results. Don't forget to like and subscribe. The Probate Realtor Matias Baker Mazzucci is a licensed real estate broker in California, DRE number 02054763. Any legal information provided is for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. Contact an attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular legal issue or problem. We make no guarantees as to the accuracy of any information. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.